Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 307 RPG Podcast. My name is Patrick. I'm Nolan. Nolan, today we are joined by a special guest. We have Chris Zach from Twin Cities by Night. He is here to talk to us about running actual plays and running horror role-playing. Chris, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you doing? It's kind of amazing being here. I listen to you guys all the time, so being part of the podcast is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you were one of the first actual plays that I started listening to. And actually, I don't know if you remember, but a couple of years ago when we were doing actual plays, I reached out to you and you were a big help to us. So it's really cool for me to have you on the show because it's like, hey, this is somebody who actually helped us get started. So uh, it's it's cool that you're here. Awesome. Awesome. I, I'm trying to remember it. My memory is horrible, but I'm glad I helped <laughs> either way. So you, you did. You did. So so there is a lot of news that we need to cover before we jump into talking horror role playing and running actual plays with Chris. And Chris, he's been sent the show notes, so he's just going to be involved in the conversation, which is something that Noel and I decided that we wanted to start doing with all of our guests. That way you're not just sitting there going, hmm, well, this is boring. So, but before we do that, Nolan, how's your weekend? Uh, okay. A little bit of sh snow shoveling still. Happy March. Right. Please get here faster. But uh, other than that, uh, a little bit of WoW, a little bit of Apex, a little bit of Guild Wars 2, and a sick kid. So that's the first this year. Oh, no. So a little stomach bug. one? A little Zeke. So. Oh, that's unfortunate. That's your youngest, which is unfortunate. He's such a sweet kid, too. Both of your boys. I just, uh, in fact, we were talking, my wife and I were talking just yesterday with our youngest son, and then we said, so we told him, you know, Aiden, we're pretty sure that uh, Zeke and Sander like us better than you did like us. And he was like, what? You're my parents. And we're like, yeah, they cry when we leave, not you. Yeah, You're just, just like, get the hell out. He's what, 18, 19 now? So I think yeah. we're due for those days. I'm sure my kids will be a, a real pain I'm in the sure. front of a gun. So. Yeah, I'm but, sure by the time your boys are teenagers, they're going to be like, oh, look, it's Patrick and Shree again. <laughs> well, you are getting old, so we just hope you're alive by then. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my weekend has been spent shoveling snow because, well, we are in northeast Wyoming and it does snow here. Um, other than that, I've been playing a little bit of uh, World of Warcraft. I did get to spend some time with our friend John, who plays in one of our role-playing groups. Um, John K. It's not Throw because we have two Johns. Um, and we played Settlers of Catan yesterday, which is the first time I've played that game in a long time. I completely forgot any of the strategy for that game and thoroughly got my ass whipped. I mean, thoroughly. Like, I think at the end of the game, like, you're supposed to have 10 victory points. I had two. And everybody else was way ahead of me. I was like, what the shit just happened? It's nice <laughs> to be <laughs> yeah. kind of to a point where we can get back together and, and start to do some of that stuff. I definitely miss. Yeah. I mean, we didn't always play the best games. And there's some scenes in, like, Exploding Kittens or whatever it was that you can't unsee. But I'm ready for it. So, Right, right. <laughs> So let's jump in the news, because there's a lot to talk about from Wizards of the Coast this week. And we're going to start off with Dungeons & Dragons. Um, so we have some stuff for Dungeons & Dragons and for Magic the Gathering, which I know we don't usually cover, but we'll get there. So there was a new source book announced for Dungeons & Dragons this week on Richton's Guide to Ravenloft. Now, if you are a fan of D&D and you've been around as long as I have, you should know the Von Richten's name. I can remember 2nd Edition D&D where there was all sorts of these Von Richten's Guides to stuff in Ravenloft. Von Richten is very much the Volo of... Of, of Ravenloft. So it's kind of exciting to see this. So this is, like I said, Von Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. This will be one of, this has to be one of the three source books that they told that we're that they told us, wow, I am all tongue tied today, that are going to be released released. She all right, reset the brain. Release release the cracking. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> this book is scheduled to be released may 18th and pre-orders are currently available through dnd beyond and other retailers there of course will be two covers for this book the alternate art that they typically do um, which looks fantastic i have pictures of both of the covers in the show notes nolan i'm curious what are your thoughts on this book and, and actually you're our dnd guy so why don't you tell us more about what's going to be in it well uh first thing thoughts uh, i'm I'm excited for it just because we've talked about a lot on the show of it was so much more than just Strahd in the story. The, the realm itself kind of deserves to be explored more. What they were talking, something along the lines of uh, they're redefining with the introduction of 30 different domains of dread, all different horror themed settings to test the metal and morals of your players. And I think part of this came up because I didn't realize, oh, and you were explaining to me, uh, some of the Dragonlance connections with, uh, with coming in there. So I, I'm hoping, 
I'm hoping it's really good. I'm, I'm really hoping to see some sort of adventure out of it for a reason why, um, that maybe you're able to plane hop. Like I, I just, I, I'm curious about these, the, the travel between them, because when we played Curse of Strahd, it was, you, you don't get out. You're, you're here and the clock resets and this is this, this infinite loop cycle of this is what it is. It's, it's a, a personal hell almost uh, for Strahd. So I'm, I'm curious to see the reasons for jumping around, but having that, you can, it, it gives you a free license to do anything any kind of horror you want. It can be hokey, it can be cheesy, it can be scary, it can be psychological, it could just be slaughtering zombie. I mean, you know, name it and you're doing it whatever your, your table's into. So the potential is going to be great. Uh, I, I think it's going to be awesome. I'm, I'm happy it's coming out quickly too. I wasn't expecting something that fast as far as timeline, so... Right, right. And Chris, you're a big fan of horror role playing and and because obviously with the stuff that you do with your actual plays and in conversation that you and I have before we start recording, you were talking about getting into Dungeons and Dragons. What are your thoughts on this expansion? Um, I think the Ravenloft expansion really interests me. I know it's been around for like a long time from my understanding and like the um has like the kind of Count Dracula kind of like figure who runs things. Of course it's more in depth than that, I'm very much I'm very sure. I I, I it sounds Interesting to be honest, that's like when I recently bought the fifth ed player's guide and DM's guide because you guys listen to you guys talk about DD and I was just sh uh, shooting the shit with the gang members and, and they were like, Red Ravenloft. <laughs> that was like the first thing, the curse of Strahd. It was like, just because of like, that's our, you know, the vibe that we tend to enjoy. And there's a lot of good actual plays out there who have done it. So yeah, I'm excited, man. Like, Wizards of the Coast seems to know what they're doing. I mean, I, I think I saw an article headline where it says, like, Wizards of the Coast makes more money than Hasbro does or something like that. It's, like, their biggest yeah. like, earner. So, I mean, they're doing something right. And, you know, this, this, they hit gold in those hills. Yeah. yeah. You know, I happen to be a huge fan of Ravenloft. Ravenloft, when I was playing AD&D 2nd Edition, uh, I picked up the, the Ravenloft box set. I picked up some of the Von Richten stuff. Uh, so, this is this is hitting all the feels for me. Plus, it's... It's very much horror, the World of Darkness type stuff. This is like World of Darkness for Dungeons and Dragons, if you will. So I'm really excited about this book. Uh, the alternate art for this book is amazing. It has Esmeralda on there. It's got a werewolf, some ghosts, and I look, I'm pretty sure that's Strahd in the background. Um, if not, it's another Dreadlord. Nolan, you were talking about the the Dragonlance tie-in. So the very the second novel in the Ravenloft uh, world was Night of the Black Rose. And that took Lord Soth from Kryn into Ravenloft and made him a Dreadlord of Ravenloft. And and keep in mind, folks, uh, Ravenloft is a collection of demi-planes. And there's a mist that separates the borders of each plane. So the Dreadlords technically cannot go through the mist to attack each other, but they do fight each other. So they have agents that are able to go through the mist, which was typically handled by the Vistani. And I'm curious how they're going to change that, because I know with all the inclusionary stuff that Wizards is working on, especially when it comes to Vistani in Ravenloft, in fact, uh, the Curse of Strahd revamped, which is sitting back here. Thank you, Nolan. Um, really changed how the Vistani was handled. And I haven't read through that book and I need to. Um, so I'm really curious to see how they're going to handle that, especially since Esmeralda is a Vistani. So it, it's interesting. I think it's going to be freaking badass. We should have saw it coming, Nolan. We were talking about the Gothic lineages, uh, the UA that they did, uh, which let's face it, Ravenloft is their Gothic horror realm. We should have seen this one coming. I don't know how we didn't. I guess we were just clueless. So <laughs> Well, and I think when we talked about it, we were talking about... Uh... Uh, a magic tie-in, the next source book, going to Innistrad. Right, Innistrad, right. So yeah, so we'll get we'll get those subclasses you're talking about that were in the UA. Uh, looks like we're going to get the Undead Pact of the Warlock that was also in it, and then the College of Spirits Bard. So a couple of classes, uh, a couple of backgrounds, uh, and then what else did I see that was kind of interesting? Oh, uh, over about forty pages of horrific monsters which I think will be good. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit too of uh, Volo's Guide to Spirits and Specters. We had seen some of that stuff kind of hinted in the past. And I think maybe that was kind of building up here as well. So it looks like it's got a, a pretty healthy book for everybody, which is nice to see because sometimes it's, this is a DM's book, this is a player's book. Um, this one here is going to be good. I, I like it. I think the timing will be fun. It'll be able to pick it up, learn a little bit of it and, between it and some Scarlands uh, creature collection, we should have a, a pretty awesome uh, Halloween bash. So, yeah, no shit. <laughs>
Uh, so, th like I said, there is two different covers to this book. I did go ahead and immediately reach out to Puzzles, our local game store, chat it with Halen. He does have my name on the list of the alternate arts. So as soon as that book comes in, I will throw be throwing that in the collection. This is not, Chris, this isn't a completionist thing, I swear. This is just one of those things where Ravenloft happens to be my favorite D&D &D setting, so... For sure, I understand completely. <laughs> Out of, little context, we're talking about collecting books yeah. before recording. So. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that is the big news out of D&D. Again, that'll be coming out, what is that, May 18th. Uh, it is available for pre-order on every major uh, retailer. I did find it on Amazon, and I found it on Barnes & Noble. And, of course, if you don't want to be that person who has to have the book on the shelf and you're okay with the digital, I think for twenty nine ninety five right now, you can get it on D&D Beyond. So that is a great resource for you if you're willing to buy it digitally. I, I want to stick with that's getting closer because I was afraid it's going to be another fifty dollars book, and we've talked about getting the the twenty thirty dollars books more consistently. Uh, right, and and that's I I'm hoping they see that people just devour content. Like they could put out probably eight books a year and double their money fairly easily. Uh, you don't want to lose quality, but again, something more consistent. Uh, you know, and maybe hopefully we'll get some adventures with it too. So. Well, and that's that's my big thing with with D and D. You know, D and D used to be you buy like a supplement book, a core book, or or whatever a source book, and then there were supplemental adventures that you could buy, uh, typically a lot cheaper uh, than spending the fifty dollars on a hardbound book. It kills me that every time I turn around, I'm buying a game book. I'm spent. It's a fifty dollar bill every freaking time, and I'm okay with picking up some modules that are nineteen and twenty dollars that are going to supplement with. Now I know we have Adventure League, and I know we can buy those, but Adventure League is very much tied into folks who are going to be doing adventures at a convention and yeah we've we've used them a little bit on in our games but for the most part it is convention related and i would love to see some of these people start creating stuff that isn't and i'm fine with it being on like the dm skill like a drive through rpg type thing but give us more content that that doesn't cost me 50 freaking dollars every time yeah, something we can pick up and play in between. Your players aren't ready to be level five, but the story is ready to be level five. Pick up a level three to five adventure that's, you know, $14. Right. Totally agree. I want to jump over to magic. I did mention this earlier, and I'd be remiss not to mention this. I am a magic judge, so magic is, you know, near and dear to my heart. And I so I do feel like this needs to be brought up, especially since we are Lord of the Rings fans. And, oh, look, there is going to be a Lord of the Rings Magic the Gathering set. So magic recently announced, or I should say Wizards or Hasbro, Hasbro did spin off Wizards of the Coast. This was just announced to their investors. Uh, so Wizards of the Coast will be its own entity. So it'll be responsible for generating its own money. And as Chris pointed out, they do a good job at doing that. So we they did announce two new partnerships for Magic the Gathering. The first is Warhammer 40K, which blew my fucking mind. I'm a huge fan of Warhammer. And the fact that they did this, wow, Chris, I see the look on your face. Uh, are you a fan of Warhammer? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I know a lot of people are, a lot of people in the gang are, so I, I mean, it seems like Magic is just, like, branching out to other IPs, and it's kind of, kind of, I used to play Magic, like, like, back in 1994, 95, like, when the first two, uh, Ice Age, well, the first one, then Ice Age came out, Arabian Nights, like, I used to play back then. And I use the term loosely play, you know, I was figuring it out, but that's really cool. Yeah, so the, the, the Warhammer 40k, uh, set will be commander decks now if they stick with what they've done uh the commander decks there should only be five of them and i was trying to talk i was talking with nolan trying to speculate and i'll have to write an article on my speculations on what the five commander decks are going to be because they're going to be multicolored, and i do have some ideas for that so i'll i'll go into that later for in a at an article on the on the website but i am excited about the warhammer 40k crossover because like i said i love warhammer and the idea that i could very possibly be playing with the bad and the despoiler as my commander in a chaos space marine commander deck i'm all in <laughs> the other set like i said is going to be a lord of the rings set now i should say the commander decks are not going to be standard legal um, and I don't believe the Lord of the Rings ones are either. If I remember correctly, reading uh, what I read was these are all going to be part of what Magic is calling Universes Beyond. Now, if you follow Magic, you know that the Seeker Layers that they do has included some of the stuff for Universes Beyond, including Walking Dead. So they do have a very small set. It's like seven or eight cards, uh, for, and they're all foiled for the Walking Dead. 
And they are saying that is going to be grandfathered and ergo making it the first um, universes beyond set. This tells me that they are going to be at least speculative, that they are going to be looking at other IPs to bring in as crossovers for magic. I am excited about both of these sets. Uh, specifically, like I said, I like the idea of playing with a Chaos Space Marine Commander deck, but when it comes to Lord of the Rings, Nolan, you and I were kind of talking about this, and I wanted to touch on this a little bit because one of the things we had said is we're okay with this provided, and what was that provision we talked about? I have no idea. We talked about a lot of stuff. <laughs> we do talk about a lot of stuff. Well, that provision was is we're okay with Lord of the Rings being a set in Magic provided that we only play with Lord of the Rings cards. Because the idea of Gandalf squaring off with Jace just doesn't do it for me. Well, and I think looking at their plan, it seems like that's what it's going to be. Right? It, Universe Beyond will not be standard legal. They want them to be useful. Uh, but nothing's changing with what they've got going on. Uh, having Godzilla in there. Uh, having Walking Dead, having Lord of the Rings, having Commander. I mean, they, it really kind of shows that they can go anywhere with it. Um, the other thing that we talked about was treating it with respect. And I think that's the big thing. And I, 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 I can't imagine you would see Warhammer in a magic card unless they were 100% sure they've seen the product. They're like, you're doing us justice. And, and how much of it is going to be like, I'm probably never going to play with it, but I'm going to make sure I have one of Aragorn and Gandalf. And, you know, it's going to be a collector's thing and it's going to go on the wall behind me. You know, so I, you definitely know that's what they're going after. I'm scared to see the prices uh, once people are, are getting them because we're fanatics. We buy, you know, $150 statues, you know, that are, are what they are. So um, I like the other or thing on there. Like that. We buy swords. We buy, you know, so uh, they also talked about uh, Forgotten Realms. And, and it will not be a part of the universe of beyond, but seeing that as well. Right. So. It, it, it kind of makes me happy. I don't want to, I don't know. I, I'm, I know I'm getting old because I used to really like the mashups. Now I don't want to see Jace versus Gandalf versus Elementster. That's not a wizard battle I want to see. Now that I've said it out loud, let's just throw in, you know, Dumbledore and we'll go for the commander hat trick here or whatever. Now I do want to see it. So maybe I'm not that old. I don't know. Well, and I like the idea that Forgotten Realms is going to be standard legal. It's not going to be universes beyond. So you will be able to do things like have, I, I would, if they print it, I'd imagine they'd have to, uh, like Drit Stewart, who I would wager is not going to be a planeswalker. He's going to be a legendary creature, whereas Elminster will probably be a planeswalker. Uh, we'll see some of those higher level wizards who are planeswalkers. So I'm excited about it. I think all of these sets, and I forgot to even mention it, uh, Adventures in Forgotten Realms is what that set's going to be called. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I think this is neat. It's a great way to breathe some life into magic. There's been such a push to have it digitally that it's, I don't know, magic has been tough lately for me. And I just actually just went and bought some cards yesterday. And it was like, wow, you know, I just bought these. And it reminded me quickly that although I enjoy opening packs, there's no point in buying packs. Just buy the specific cards you're looking for and be done with it. <laughs> You'll save yourself money. Yeah, it usually is cheaper in almost every way. Yep. So that is everything that we saw from Wizards of the Coast. Nolan, did you see anything else that I'm missing? I didn't. It was it, it was kind of surprising. I mean, that was just a big right. announcement. Chris, did you see anything from Wizards of the Coast that maybe I forgot to mention? No, sir. Good deal. Good deal. So let's jump over to Paradox because, again, we have some news to talk about. And this is something Chris and I were talking about earlier. So earlier this week, Paradox announced that they have removed the lead developer Hard Suit Labs from Bloodlines 2 indefinitely postponing the release of this game and suspending all pre-orders. This is the second time the game has been delayed, as in August, Paradox fired the lead writer, who was also from Hard Suit Labs, uh, Brian Mitsoda. Um, so my question to both of you, is the game dead? Chris, we'll start with you. Yes. Yes, the game is dead. And people need to realize that Paradox has no idea what they're doing. And Paradox, this is par for the course. I mean... You can go back on a long track record of Paradox being quick to try to rush stuff to get money, pre-orders, people not getting their stuff in time. It's just a hot mess. And I'm going to be honest, Paradox slash World of Darkness, like they call themselves now, they don't want to be tied to White Wolf or whatever. Their, their main thing now is social media influencing and trying to like control the narrative like that and building this whole... Uh, I'm going to go on a little tangent, but this whole... like quote unquote community cult mentality with the whole family thing to get to where if people even question what's going on with paradox they kind of get badgered by these people who who are just like almost cultists when it comes to the whole vampire thing you know what i mean so 
it, it is what it is. I um not here to be like super negative, but people need to open up their eyes and realize that paradox is a hot freaking can I curse on here? <laughs> oh, yes, you paradox can. is a hot fucking mess right now. And people need to realize that shit. And people need to hold them accountable. And when they try to push stupid shit like, oh, um, but followers set bingo or Melkavian bingo cards and, and they're not actually like working on producing quality stuff. Um, people need to hold them accountable because that's all just distractions right now. So in my I, opinion. <laughs> you know, and I think back to the World of Darkness MMO and how that just got completely scrapped. And and it, there's definitely a trend here. And I know that uh, as Chris and I have talked, and even Nolan, you and I have talked, there are some issues with 5e. Now, I used to put a lot of the blame of that on Modifius. And, and I still do, because I think Modifius did a... I don't think they cared for the IP. And so the stuff that we saw coming out was just poorly done. It's not that the creative aspect wasn't there. It wasn't that the idea behind it wasn't good, like the fall of London. I think the idea behind bringing Mithras back in some way is awesome. It was just edited was editing was poor. Layout was poor. The technical side of it was just poor and it made it so where you didn't want to buy the game. That's a different story though. Nolan, I am curious. What do you think? Is the game dead? I, I'm going to go with, yeah. And I think part of it is couldn't get stuff going. Uh, consistency with COVID uh, just put a strain on everything. You can't just have money out there. And anything I saw on their werewolf game that came out, I think I saw like three out of 10 scores. I watched reviews on it. It was just bad. There was potential there for a decent game, but it didn't, it didn't win anybody over. Uh, I think it was kind of dead on arrival as well. So I think if you have something that flops that hard, that wasn't done well, that also is, do we keep money, putting money into this? And I think they made the choice of no. Also, I mean, like Paradox is throwing their licensing at anything like at anything anyone who wants to license or stuff i mean how many card games are there how many board games are there there's makeup there's like it's just paradox bought people need to realize the sooner they realize the better paradox bought the world of darkness licensing because they were friends with martin erickson one of the owners of paradox was friends with martin erickson they bought it and they thought they were going to get rich trying to make this like some modern day um modern day like cultural you know rev cultural type thing by typing into the LARP vampire thing and it's failing it's failing horribly and and uh, it, th that is because their main priority isn't making a game their main priority is finding licensing to 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 cash in on with it thus the makeup the board games the the read-along adventure book video games whatever those are bloodlines to the the two werewolf games all that stuff and stuff said they're trying to make a quality product and if anything people need to learn don't pre-order anything that paradox makes people who pre-order bloodlines 2 are getting bit in the butt they're getting their money back people who pre-ordered vampire v5 slipcase like i did had to wait seven months you know for their stuff so it's like don't pre-order with these folks make them earn it. and they could they could turn the ship around make them earn your trust back make them earn the fact that yes they should get money from you before you see a product because they have proven they are capable of doing that and as of now i don't think they're proven they're capable of doing that Right. I will say I am excited that Justin Achille is back in the World of Darkness and, and that he is one of the lead developers for it. Because if there's anybody who knows the World of Darkness and knows vampires specifically, he's definitely one of those people. So I am glad that he is involved with it once again. Um, I do. I did like the V5 companion that came out. I thought that was actually one of the more well-done pieces that they've done recently. Um, and, and, and again, I said on, on the show that Modifius had nothing to do with that. And and I was very pleased with that. Now, I, I don't want to sit here and just say that I'm bashing Modifius because I've looked at other Modifius books and they're very well done. Very well done. Their Octon Cthulhu stuff is very good. Um, other books like their Star Trek, Star Trek stuff has been very well laid out and very well edited. Whomever they put in charge of Vampire just didn't seem to care. And so, and maybe it was somebody from Paradox that was doing it that was, you know, on the team with Modifius. I, I, I don't know, but it was, it was not well done at all so very frustrated there uh, i don't disagree with you guys with that I, I i do think bloodlines is dead which sucks uh, now i never played the original bloodlines i have it which makes no sense because uh, oh look another game that i bought and never played i think we can all relate to that um however i was kind of looking forward to you know bloodlines too i after getting it my ass bit with cyberpunk i'm just like meh and, you know, and Chris, you talked about the the read by play, whatever games, Coteries in New York or, or, or Shadows in New York, whatever those were called. I did try Coteries in New York. It was boring. I mean, I think I got like 10 minutes in. I'm like, wow, I am so freaking bored with this game. I don't want to do a choose your own adventure game. 
I think what uh, it comes down to, and I'm not, I never played Cyberpunk, the RPG, or the video game, but I've read the, <laughs> heard all the stories about the video game being pulled off the PSN, all that jazz. I really think what this comes down to is that companies, and I'm not trying to like go on some tangent, but companies want to cash in on IP, and they, and they think that just the fact that if they create something, they're going to get that that the the fans are going to automatically buy it, and and they don't care about the quality of it, you know. And Cyberpunk's a big case. But also Vampire is like that too. You, I mean, you can still release, they can release anything with the term Vampire in it and they're going to have people who are going to buy it no matter what and who are going to push it no matter what and who are going to be fanatical about it because it's a part of their identity. And that's what these role-playing games, these gaming companies do is they realize people game and, and gaming is a part of their identity and they take, try to take advantage of that to get money. That's, some of them will put out substandard stuff knowing that people are going to buy it no matter what. And even if people give it a negative review, people are going to defend it till they're blue in the face just because it's a part of their identity. Right, right. Although I will say the Heritage Board game, um, I was looking at the quality of that game and just reading through it. It's it's awesome. They did a hell of a job with that. That's nice. Yeah, it looks cool. I, I think I backed it. I don't know if I got it. <laughs> it was one of those I was going through back and then you think up our phase, you know, so... Yeah, yeah. Speaking of uh, Kickstarters, let's jump over to Onyx Path real quick because they do have a new Kickstarter going, but it's not a Kickstarter. It's an Indiegogo. As we mentioned last week, uh, Victorian Age Mage is currently on uh, Indiegogo. Onyx Path has stated that they wanted to try out other platforms besides Kickstarter. Doesn't mean that they're giving up on Kickstarter. In fact, uh, they have another Kickstarter starting very soon for Trinity. Uh, so... I know the game looks like they surpassed their initial ask of 35,000. I want to say they're around 53 or 54,000 right now, and they are knocking down some stretch goals. I know Mage isn't the most popular World of Darkness game, and I can't imagine Victorian Age is going to be super popular, but I will say I was looking at the uh, the artwork for it, and you talk about you're hitting my feels here. You're mixing magic with steampunk. It looks good. I'm not going to back it just because I'm not going to spend, you know, $100 for a deluxe book that's truly just going to sit on my shelf like I did with the Technocracy Reloaded. Um, <laughs> but it looks pretty damn cool. Have either of you looked at this one? I, I'm a huge Mage fan. I, I never have played it or ran it. I planned around the actual play of it once I wrap up for a vampire story in Mage 20th. I think Mage 20th is one of the best role-playing books I've ever read. Um, I think it touches a lot of like cool things that I like about, um, you know, just, just about the subject or whatever. Uh, Victorian Age Mage is awesome. I For whatever gripes I may have occasionally with Onyx Path, I think they produce good quality stuff. I think uh, uh, the whole ask, the, the whole thinking of like mage in the uh, 19th century with all like the secret societies in London, I think of, you know, like the order of Hermes and like all the, I mean, this is before Crowley, but all the, you know what I mean? All the seventh circle, the white initiative dragon solar burst or whatever, you know, like I just, it really excites me. So I'm actually thinking about backing that one. I haven't backed the Onyx Path one in a while. So I'm, I, I'm thinking about it. You, you talked about Onyx Path stuff and truthfully, I don't care what you say about Onyx Path the quality of the books that they put out is phenomenal. I mean, every book I've gotten uh, through Kickstarter, through Onyx Path, very well edited, very well laid out. They make great use of space and the quality of the print is top notch. And of the, I think I have two deluxe books. They're, they're awesome. They're incredible books. They're obviously collector's items. So I'm really excited about this one. I won't be backing it just because I, it's it's just I don't need another deluxe book sitting on the shelf. Nolan, I know you and I haven't played Mage at all, but we have talked about it. What are your thoughts on this one? I I like the time period, and I, I think it hints on those same things. Of I really like Dark Ages Vampire just because it was before the technology, right? It, it was when mysticism still lived, where we didn't have Google at our fingertips to prove stuff wrong. And so seeing that time period for a mage when you could get away with doing some shit, I was I was pretty excited for us like i like this better but i'm also a high fantasy person so dark ages vampire was great because you could cover your tracks you could blame it on the plague like you, you got away with more stuff it was kind of at the height and i'd be curious to see this one here it doesn't necessarily seem to be at the height but at the age of discovery and i think that would be a lot of fun of like you were saying with the councils and, and the secret societies of we're tapping into something here this is going to be the start of something that's going to protect the world but we're still trying to figure it out so i, I think the i I like the idea of it. I would probably get more into this than I would probably the the a more modern version, just because. Sure. Technology messes with my fun sometimes, just because it is so much harder to do stuff, and I think that's the point. Don't get me wrong, but I, 
I'm used to being a hero or a badass. And when you got to hide it all day long, like, what's the point? Like, geez, Superman who doesn't fly sounds pretty boring. So, <laughs> right. Chris, I'm curious because I'm, I'm not sure. You did mention that you're a big mage fan. I am too. It's also like you. I've never been able to play it. It's one of those games that I love that I've never played, kind of like Cyberpunk. Um, is this a remake of a book, the Victorian Age Mage, or is this the first time that they've dove into it? No, it's the first time they dove into it, from my understanding. Uh, basically, uh, Victorian Age was supposed to be like a game line like uh, Dark Ages. You know, For those that don't know, there's Dark Ages Vampire, Werewolf, Hunter, all that stuff. And they were going to do towards the end of the uh, original World of Darkness, uh, you know, whatever, um, White Wolf era, they released Victorian Age Vampire. They also released the Player's Guide and London by Night, which were Victorian Age. Uh, we actually have an actual play of Victorian Age on our podcast. Um, and so from my understanding, this is going to be like another, you know, in the Victorian Age line. So I don't know if they ever plan to do like Victorian Age Werewolf or Changeling or, or you know, whatever. Wraith, I think, would be awesome. They kind of have that weird, you know, vibe. Um, but those are questions that know on its path probably yeah. but i know victorian age mage has been in the talks for like three years i remember people talking about like three or four years ago so so is victorian age vampire is that 20th anniversary edition or is that revised or something? it was revised it came out okay. at the end of the revised line yeah so i don't know if on its path ever plans to do it again but it's interesting i mean for those who, who may want to get a vibe of what the 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 um the setting is like there's a trilogy of novels called the victorian age vampire trilogy um I'm not a big fan of like IP novels. I tend to find them to be a little corny, but these three are like really good. There's scenes like that are so fucked up. I had to put the book down and be like, you know, talking about horror. Yeah. And so for that to be in vampire novels, which most of the time if I roll my eyes so far back, I see the back of my head. Um, these, these are really good. So people should check them out. Philip Brule, I think his name is, wrote them. So. Okay. I'll have to check those out too. Uh, jumping over to Tolis. Nolan, do we have any updates on Tolis? I haven't seen anything. It's been fairly quiet. Uh, every now and then I get a picture or two like that, but I think we're kind of in the home stretch here. So I'm hoping the next news we get is the big news. Yeah, I think soon you're just going to have this email show up from a shipping company. You're going to be like, what is this? And then you realize your UPS driver is about to sue you because his back went out like, carrying your goddamn big box. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Not my back. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Speaking of Kickstarters and s things of that nature, the One Ring, uh, as we've stated, the One Ring Kickstarter is completely funded. I think they're sitting at 1.4 million right now, which is insane because I think the initial ask was only, only $10,000. So, yeah, it is amazing how well this is done. Percent higher, holy or whatever, holy shit! <laughs> yeah, it is huge. And as I've been saying, I did end up going ahead and backing this one. I did not do the collector's edition, and the reason behind that is, and Nolan and I had a lot of conversation about this one here, was I ultimately want to use the book, and I would be very upset if I ruined a collector's edition. And my thought was the or the regular edition looks beautiful. It's a great looking book. I'm okay with buying this and using it. Hopefully I don't ruin it. Um, and of course I, it does come with, and, and I was really happy about this as well, is that it does come with a PDF. Now, I, I, I can't tell you, I, I cannot tell you how excited I am about this, this Kickstarter. It looks like it's supposed to be fulfilled in November of this year, which would be, tells me that the game is done. Now they're just trying to get the final pieces put in place so they can get the game printed and shipped. Uh, you know, here it is, what? We're about to hit March tomorrow, and they're telling me in November I'm going to have this Kickstarter fulfilled. Holy crap, that's super quick for a Kickstarter. So I'm okay with that. Um, with it being second edition, they kind of knew what they were doing. Uh, they knew they had a following. And I honestly think this was just like, how much are we going to print? I mean, we're going to do this. How many do we need to yeah, do? Exactly. And then now I'm not so certain. I think that was such a good idea. But I, how would you, how would you guess, right? You know, we're gonna we're gonna put out this much content, and then, you know, some people are gonna buy it. We're gonna print this many books or whatever, and this and this and this. And then you run a Kickstarter and it hits 1.4, probably 1.5 million dollars before it's done. There's there's no way you could have guessed that it was going to be. I mean, I don't care who you are. I don't think anybody's that arrogant saying, yeah, we're gonna do, you know, 5,000 books, you know, and, and before it even, you know, it's just insane. It, it really is. And, and, you know, they had they had stretch goals up to a million dollars. And, of course, those are all unlocked now. So now they're adding more stuff. Like, I just got an email yesterday, I think it was, to let us know that it'll be an add-on. But uh, you can get, instead of the, the fold-out paper map of, of Middle Earth, it's now a roll-out cloth map that you can get. Which I was like, 
I don't think I need that, but I'm not going to lie. I'm a little tempted. I look badass on your wall, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. My wife not, might not appreciate that being the new blanket on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think it, it ties into what you guys were talking about earlier too. Of you, you can throw a Lord of the Rings thing out there, and I'm probably going to have a hard time not buying it for the sake of the IPO. Um, but when you see somebody that takes it, cares for it, and does it right, these are the results you get. This isn't somebody just throwing out a Lord of the Rings thing. This is somebody who who loves the game, handles it with care is a passion project coming together in that thing. And that's what I think we hope for all of them. You know, I think that's why we're scared of the, the D and D movies. We're scared of, you know, the world world of Warcraft movies. It's like, okay, are you, are you going to handle it with care or are you just trying to make a quick buck? Um, and when you do everything right, you get $1.5 million on your Kickstarter book. Amen. Amen. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, free league is, is not a company that I'm too familiar with. Uh, I know they are a gaming company based in, I believe, Swiss or Sweden. Sorry, um, one of the books that they did recently, and I and I forgot because we actually talked about it on the show was Vessen, which is a Nordic horror role playing game, uh, and I had never heard of it. And we did mention it quickly on our show once because I think there was a Kickstarter for it. This is, you know, I was kind of doing some reading, trying to figure out exactly what Free League does and, and just check out some of their other games. And I remembered, obviously, I saw this and I was like, oh, wait, we talked about this one. So I went and I would look through and I was reading through that book and the reviews on that book. And I was intrigued enough that I went ahead and purchased the book. Um, the artwork looks I mean, This is one of the books that I know I'm just going to enjoy reading. Um, so I think once that book gets in, Nolan, that might be one that I lend to you so we can both read through it and then we do a show on it because I do think it's going to be an interesting thing. And I thought, you know, it'd be neat to just look at some of the other products that Free League is putting out because it looks like they got some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I, I'm excited to play it. I know a lot of people are excited for it. I mean, it, it obviously, but I mean, just from a standpoint of, I think a lot of the sales aren't because it's Lord of the Rings necessarily. I think it's because they do a good game. So, uh, man, yeah, might be time to take a break from 5e for a while. Right. All right, D&D, &D, we're going to put you in the shelf. We're playing Lord of the Rings for the next 10 years. <laughs> Never coming home. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, so that is the news that I have found. There, I'm sure there's a lot of other stuff that I could have could have come up with, but I wanted to make sure we had enough time because we got a fairly large topic to talk with Chris about today. Um, and I wanted to make sure we had enough time for that. So like I said, we did bring Chris on the show. We wanted to talk about running actual plays because Chris runs a pretty much a worldwide network, I think last time you and I chatted about it, uh, of role players who do actual plays, as well as the, mo the primary focus on the stuff that you guys do is horror role playing. Isn't that correct, Chris? Yes, sir. Yeah, to both of them. I'm, I mean, yeah, I got 10 people, uh, you know, all the way from like Germany, uh, the Netherlands, uh, New Zealand, Czech Republic, multiple states in America, you know, who are involved in, uh, in Twin Cities by Night. Yeah, and we, we focus on horror and kind of, kind of like those uh, types of themes of games. I and mean, we've sidestepped a couple of times and done like 13th Age, but even like 13th Age has kind of a horror, you know, that we do it, you know, kind of a little bit of a horror vibe to it too. So there's different... Um, a wide color palette when it comes to horror, you know, so. <laughs> so why don't you tell us about Twin Cities by Night and how it got started? Oh, geez. Okay. So uh, Twin Cities by Night is an actual play podcast. We've been doing it for almost five years now. Uh, we, when we originally started, we weren't like expecting to be like public. We didn't even know what the term actual play was. Uh, how it started was I used to play Vampire the Masquerade um, like for a couple of years from like 2000 or 99 to like 2001, 2002. And then in 2015, uh, I was cutting weight for a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournament and just miserable. And I was looking for things to make me feel better. And I remembered that Vampire the Masquerade game. So I started just like Googling. I was at work, bored, should have been working instead of surfing the web. And I was Googling and I found that Vampire was still a thing. So I ended up uh, going on eBay, buying the revised edition of Vampire the Masquerade because that was the edition that was uh, around when I played. And um, I had an old buddy from the military uh, that that reached out to me about something else. I was like, hey, we used to play this vampire game. If I put a game together, would you play it online? He said, sure. So I put out a fly, uh, kind of like a uh, help wanted ad on Reddit, uh, you know, say the White Wolf Reddit that's still around saying, hey, is anyone interested in playing in a vampire game? And I had a dude from Czech Republic, Slavic. I had a guy from uh, uh, New Zealand, Alex, and a guy from Phoenix, Quinn, who was like, yeah, we'll play. And so originally we, uh, we, 
played on Google Hangouts, which would automatically record on YouTube. And we were recording on YouTube just so that we would have a reference to go back and to listen. We actually almost didn't record on YouTube because we couldn't figure out how to make the camera switch from one person to another when it was playing. And because Slavic and I were trying this out, we realized you need more than two people. We almost gave up on it until one of us, I can't remember who, like Googled and found the answer. Um, eventually, though, like through, uh, we found out that people actually like played actual plays then. And we started, uh, you know, we'd start sharing it. At that time, we were on YouTube and we're just like, you know, fucking four dudes picking our nose, playing the game. And, you know, I noticed that we weren't really like able to compete against like kind of like the Twitch type streams where people put like more, you know, um, visual, um, visual stuff into it. So one day I was in my office and I was playing um, uh, uh, one of the Vampire Masquerade Wars on Fire episodes we're playing. And I was like doing something in my office. I realized when I was just hearing it audio, through audio, just like hearing the audio aspect of it, I was able to like, um immerse myself more into it where i was watching on screen i would see like me look like a doofus drinking something in the background or whatever and be more distracted by that so i came to the gang like hey what do you think like we made this like a podcast and mo focus more on podcasting and everyone agreed um and then through the trials and errors of learning about like um editing and microphone quality and all that stuff you know we're at, we're at where we're at now and now we, you know with having 10 people kind of we grew from that original like those original four players and we've added more people now we're able to like have like uh we currently have um like three different chronicles going on we have a monster hearts chronicle we just started called fuck Mary to kill we have one uh dawn darker trails called a cthulhu game uh called missouri crossing and then i'm running vampire the masquerade uh twin cities by night eidolon which is like a duet uh game with adam uh where he plays giovanni and then we have like one shots that we randomly do if we have any anyone has an idea so Oh uh, yeah, we're just a well-oiled machine, man. We're just rocking and rolling. It's kind of crazy because it used to be like where I was like doing all the editing and doing the thumbnails and now it's like everyone does stuff and I feel like I'm just along for the ride. It really is kind of like surreal when you, like two months will go by, three months will be like, shit, we released something. You know, we, we record, it's like not as much uh, stress and pressure it used to be, uh, you know, when we we're first getting going. So, and it's a passion, so love it. I know I've listened to, there was a Chronicle, the Chronicles of Darkness games that you guys did. Um, I think it was set in like the 1930s in the Midwest. I'm trying to remember because it's been a couple of years since I listened to it. That was yeah, really, really good. Yes, yes, that's yeah. it. Um, yeah, I've listened it. to, um, Sorry. no, go ahead. What were you saying? That was, that, that was our first one shot. That was actually our first one shot that Quinn ran. We never ran a one shot before. And that was our first one. It was creepy. It was so good. I really enjoyed it. Uh, there's, um, what is it? War is by Night? Wars on Fire, yeah, Wars, Wars on, on Fire, fire yes. which is the Sabat game that, yeah, that I ran, which, uh, Wars on Fire was actually, like, the story where we kind of, like, found our voice, in a way, like, we ran, I had ran two stories before that, uh, Vampire the Masquerade, Twin Seas by Night, Negligence, and Homecoming, and Wars on Fire, though, was, I think, where we really found, like, this is our style, like, this is, like, what we do here, you know, and, um, that was a story that originally was, um, it kind of blows me away, because originally it was supposed to be a hack and slash, it was supposed to be, like, a break, from like a normal vampire game, I'm like, oh, let's just make a sabot pack. We'll just go, you know, go fuck shit up. And ended up becoming like this deep, like introspective story on about like humanity and the crisis of who you are. And I did like all these like deep philosophical, like things went behind it, family and loyalty and all this crazy stuff. And it actually blows my mind that like, like there's a lot of people who listen to us who are like fanatical about like that story, like wrote fan fiction. We actually did an audio I didn't do it. It was a surprise that the gang gave me for Valentine's Day where they did an audio reenactment of um, of uh, Wars on Fire fan fiction that someone did. What, what do you call it where, like, people who do fan fiction, like, like take characters and they can be in a relationship? There's a term for it. I forgot what that term is. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's some kind of term. I didn't realize it. And so they did it, like, as a joke, but, like, they recorded this audio drama where people narrate it and had people do voice acting, and then they gave it to me for, like, Valentine's Day because they know it would make me feel uncomfortable because it always blows my mind that people, like, take these stories and do that. So we released that on our Patreon. I was like, we got to share this. This is so crazy, you know? But anyways, yeah, I digress. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. And let's say I've also listened to Delta Green. There was a, a Delta Green episode that you guys did. Um, and it's not always the same people. And that's what I enjoy about it. It's not always the same people doing the same thing. And now, don't get me wrong. I, I love, like, I, I do listen to Red Moon Role Playing. And I and I love some of the stuff that they do because they it is, like, super, 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? On point, yeah. It's well, it's on point, but it, on it's... Point. It, they, I mean, you're dealing with people who are professional theater actors, right? And so everything that they do is so edited, so 
uh, perfected like the music, everything. I mean, they add everything. What I like about the Twin Cities crew is you guys put out a great product. You have a great story. You're not professionals. So you still get that. You get that feel of this could be the group sitting around, you know, your crew sitting around the table playing and it's still a quality product. Thank you. That means a lot. Yeah. Just a lot of tweaking, man. Like a lot of like, just like the, th the, the worst enemy of like, I think any content creator, especially actual plays is to like be stagnant. You know, there's always something that can like be improved. Not that like we're stressing ourselves out. Like, Oh, you know, we kind of find the next best thing, but like, there's like editing you can find a little learn a little new trick you know what i mean it's just a little bit a little bit that you add to it you know and we as a podcast we we kind of joke around we'll go through like these uh bur we call like bubble burst periods of our podcast where like things will kind of be running the same and then boom like this inspiration will happen then like all this stuff like delta green was that uh you know adam was obsessed with delta green now like we're known for like these delta green duets that he does that are just like really fucking good and blows away anything that i've ever done you know and, and he's so humble which is hilarious dude. he's like so self that not self-doubting like but he's like oh man i think i'm bomb like dude your shit is so fucking good like shut up you know what i mean <laughs> like you know but yeah so we go through these creative bursts you know you, you got to kind of evolve the whole time man or you can easily face burnout or you know so that's what we try to do just find like little um things to get better no, and I know you and I have struggled sometimes, like because we did start out doing actual plays. And God, you remember some of the frustrations we had? Well, I think a lot of it too is getting people in You're a muted, room. Bro. Oh, I'm sure. There we go. I don't know why it does that sometimes. I, I think a lot of it too, trying to do it in a room with everybody versus online has been so much easier. You know, as far as that goes, or you know, is it's easier to do it this way because everybody's in control of their own stuff. The echoes getting everybody to, you know, be quiet while the other people are talking, you know, all that stuff. Push to talk is a godsend, especially in a house full of kids and that kind of stuff. So, I, but it is one of those things of you try it, you do a little bit, you learn, you edit, you grow, um, and you kind of move forward. And towards the end of it, you kind of get something that you really like, but it sucks starting out. I mean, it really does just because I don't think anybody, nobody wants to put yourself out there and be embarrassed by it. I think we, you know, you talk about having the self doubt and putting yourself out there. Everybody has that and nobody's, you know, proud of their own stuff, but we love the stuff that the people are doing around us. So it's, it's a, it's a scary leap and, and seeing it get crafted yeah. and honed and into something where you can start to have that creative stuff of, I'm not worried about the audio right now, unless I'm muted, you know, but I, I'm, you know, it, it's, it's the little things that you get used to along the way. Yeah, I know, Chris. Yeah, I, like I talked ahead. about um, that. You were one of the first people that I that I reached out to because yours actually is truly Twin Cities by Night is the first actual play that I listened to, uh, and it prompted me because we were struggling so much with actual plays. That's I reached out to you and was like, "Hey, you know, some of the questions I asked was how do you get around the echo? How do you get around who does all your editing stuff like that?" Um, and it was really an eye opener for me to think about because you know we're sitting around the table with three different Yeti microphones and it's causing kind of, you know feedback and echo and stuff like that. You talk about frustrated. There was times where I just scrapped the whole thing. I'm like, "No, we're not doing this. I'm not putting it out. It sounds like shit." Or we we have the microphone set up like you know we learned about the rule of three feet for each microphone, and so we had the microphone space all around the room and then next thing you know it's sitting too close to somebody and i can hear them breathing and you don't want to hear that over and over and over or or you know because let's face it when you sit at a table and play with each other you typically there's going to be a snack involved and now you hear that person eating potato chips or something like that yeah exactly and you're just like god why am i wasting my time doing this i mean no one how many times did i come to you and go yeah i can't put that episode out it, it happened a lot and, and again i think it is having pride in what you do and, and caring about what you do as well so it's uh, yeah, I don't I don't miss the, the thing is there's people who like that vibe though. That's the thing. Like there's so many different kinds of like actual plays. You know, there's people who like the Twitch stuff. There's people who like the podcast stuff or stuff like mine. Or there's people who like stuff like just hey, put a microphone in the middle of the table. I want to hear everything. I want to I want to feel like I'm at the table. You know, I want to hear the side talks and the banter and all that stuff. You know. Um, so yeah, it's really just coming down to finding where your style. The thing that we're lucky is that we just play online. You know, like you said, we you know whenever someone's like oh hey i'm getting into, i'm listening to your, your i'm starting at episode one the first thing i say is audio gets better you know what I mean? because <laughs> like i went through and edited like so much of that just to make it sound better you know we didn't know about muting our mics i mean i remember like when we were ripping the audio of our youtube videos and it was like some like deep fucking scene going on like in our second story arc and you could just hear me in the microphone <sighs> 
And like I did, I had like one of those like headphone mics. I, I did and like people are talking. I'm just like, oh my god! But now we know like you know meter mics and all that stuff and stuff that's common. But yeah, it's a it's a labor of love for sure, man. So how, what would you tell somebody if, if somebody came to you and said, "Hey, Chris, we're thinking about starting an actual play podcast, kind of like I did that one time." What would you what, what what advice would you give someone? I would give the advice I would give is have fun. Like you've got to have fun. You cannot like listen. I'm gonna be um, well. I don't know. I'm gonna speak for myself here. I'm gonna be brutally fucking honest. Like this is not a job. You're not gonna make enough money that's gonna even make a fucking dent. To like do anything you know what i mean like don't think that you're gonna come into this thing and you're gonna make this well-polished object that's gonna make you the next matt mercer that's just not going to happen no knocking against matt mercer or anything it's just not gonna fucking happen and you see so many po- uh um actual plays that like show up all big and like we're gonna do this and then they fucking gone within like six months you know because they realize that oh shit you know, so um, it's all about having fun. It's all about having fun. And it's all about telling the story. You know what I mean? And the rest it, after that is, 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 um, it's just secondary. You know, one thing that we tell people too all the time, man, like you got, you know, I think one of the biggest in, unfair influences that actual plays have on people's home games is that it builds this unrealistic expectation for people what to expect at their table. Um, you know, sometimes like this is something that me and Becca from our, from our gang talk about all the time you know she runs a lot of home games and she like like wishes she could get like some of the stuff she gets from twin cities by night when we play but the thing is like you know we show up for three hours and we know we're recording so you're gonna get a different fucking mindset than someone who shows up for three hours they're gonna like play at a table you know what i mean so like don't like don't beat yourself up have fun with your friends and tell a story and i think people will um from my experience will gravitate when they feel it's like genuine you know what i mean like like, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to use the term authentic and all this, like, you know, fuck all this, like, uh, pretentious, you know, shit, but it's just like, people are going to tell, like, okay, these guys, like, are having fun playing a game and are telling the story together, and they're going to get excited by that, too, so. And it's a learning curve, bro. It's a learning curve. I mean, you got exceptions, like the Red Moon folks who, like, like you said, have that very high quality, you know, e- that editing that takes a long time, and the music, and, the, and, the, and they show up with that, but 99% of people aren't going to show up with that kind of stuff, dude, you know, so. Right, right. And what about, because there's a lot of noise in actual plays. There's a lot of people playing games. Um, do you think think it's uh something that if you are going to get into an actual play like Nolan and I talk quite a bit about you know trying to diversify or or becoming experts on one topic let's say so there's a ton of people doing D&D mm-hmm. right we see them you know D&D streams popping up everywhere do you think um if you if you're trying to get noticed that you should be that person that go-to person for like Vampire the Masquerade or Changing the Lost or, or something like that uh what would you say about that um Man, that's the the biggest challenge when it comes to creating anything is to be noticed, right? Um, I've seen in five years, people try to do a lot of different things. Well, what I know works for me uh, and for us is we are in charge of our own destiny, our own fate. No one else is. Um, no company, uh, no influencer, uh, no personality, nothing. And, not, and me personally, and again, I'm not trying to sound bitter, but I'm going to kiss no one's ring in hopes of getting like a little bit of promotion for my stuff. Because I'm going to do it myself because I want to feel that gratification knowing that, hey, we got these listeners because of our hard work we put in. Um, so social media, you got to have a social media plan when you have content and actual play and you got to stick with it. You got to find ways to get people to notice you. Um, the, the media page that I started, the, the World of Darkness on its path media page was a big tool because I found you come up to a lot of resistance when you're trying to do it yourself. You know, you can have like, uh, a forum, a web forum, or a Facebook group where if someone from like LA by Night or Critical Role posts, they get adoration and worship. Then someone like me posts, and you have these like scenester nerds who are like, "Who are you?" And they get all angry when you try to self promote, even though they worship these influencers and personalities who got big that same way. You know, um, so it's on you. Companies aren't going to do it for you. I hate to say it. I've had companies a couple times, and I love it. By the way, there's companies of the World of Darkness that like will retweet us and all that stuff, and I, I appreciate it. But we don't see these huge friggin' bumps when they do it. You know what I mean? You you don't. It's you're you've got to put in that elbow grease to do it. Um, and you gotta find and again it comes to like what I said about the podcast and element of it where you gotta find ways to improve. You can't be stagnant with your stuff and then be like, Why is no one listening? You just gotta figure out new ways of doing it. That's a, that's just how it is. And if anyone wants advice on it, hit me up and I'll do the same thing I did for Patrick with the uh with the actual place. I to me, this is like fun and I, I love sharing it because I want to see sincere, genuine people be successful in doing it. Absolutely. Nolan, do you have any questions before we move on to horror role playing? 
I don't. Uh, I think it covers a lot of it. I think you see a lot of that as well. Uh, picking a topic that you're not interested in. Uh, uh, we like we like Scarlands. I'm never going to touch Pugmire. It's not for us. I know there's not a you know there's a few people doing the live stream, but I'm not going to have fun doing it. So I probably shouldn't play it just for the sake of less people doing it. So um, people will see through it. It's just like Twitch. It's just like YouTube. You can spot a phony and a fake who's going through the motions a mile away. So uh, I, th I think that's the advice too. Is like yeah. you said, if you're not having fun, it's going to come through as well. So pick a topic you like, pick a spot you like playing in. Because at the end of the day, 90% of this is for you. You're not doing it for anybody else. I mean, if somebody happens to hop on and enjoy the ride and it'll blow your mind, but for the most part, it, it's for you and, and, and your circle. So enjoy it. Yeah, I got a fun to add to that if I could real quick. I, you know, I got a funny thing, a little funny story. Uh, I'm not going to say any names, but when V5 came out, a lot of these actual plays that were on Twitch and YouTube who've never even talked about vampires started playing vampire. And a lot of people don't know behind the scenes, they were getting paid. A lot of these people were getting paid to play vampire for the companies to help promote V5 that was about to come out. And so there's a big uh, Twitch YouTube streamer who reached out to us and were like, hey, we, we I would like you to play uh i would it was in a nutshell so i'm like i would like you to play vampire for me uh because i don't know anything about vampire uh but i'm, I'm getting an offer to play it and but you guys send me audition tapes which they're like what <laughs> and he's like and uh i'll help you out by getting you exposure and we're like no that's cool no thank you you know what i mean but like it's very easy to like oh there's a new game coming out or like dd or v5 or whatever let me play it so i get listeners no, nah, that's cool, dog. You know what I mean? I'll pass. You know what I mean? Like, you're just going to see me. If you if we had visuals, you just see me in the background, like, dead pan face, you know? <laughs> like, not enjoying it at all. So, that's that. <laughs> yeah, and I know, like, we did a little bit of with Onyx Pass streaming some Scarred Lands, and it was one of those things that we were just having fun with it. We were playing Vengeance of the Shun. We had a good time doing it. But it got to the point where, you know, being in Northeast Wyoming, sometimes our internet just isn't very good. And there's days where, like, even doing this stream for an hour – we worry about whether or not we're going to hold up. And there's a reason why we do things at, at Nolan's house. Or everything is run through his house because we know he's got the better connection. He's got the better computer. It's, you know, hedging our bets, if you will, that everything that is say stable. Um, and, and it just, that's why we backed out of the, the streaming with Onyx Path is just, we just didn't feel like we could put out a quality product. And it, there's something about, and I don't think people realize that when you do a live stream of a game, you really are performing at that point. You're not, it's not, and it, that's what's going to get people to watch. Like if you watch Critical Role, they're all voice actors and they're all performing. Yeah. Yes, they're having fun. They, you know, they generally, and that's the other thing people don't understand is that sometimes Matt's going to break the rules because, well, that's how they play and they're having fun doing it. And and I wish people, yeah. I wish more people would understand that. And I wish more people would understand that there is, <laughs> there's money that you need to invest to do a live stream. Because cameras, good cameras are not cheap. I think the one that I'm using here was one that we originally bought for a live stream, which it's $100. And then yeah. your microphone, minimum of $100. Minimum, uh, yeah. yeah. And so, and, and like Chris, you had mentioned that you have a laptop set up just so you can do it. So there's another three, four, five dollars $500 investment. It's not a cheap investment. And that's why we backed out of actual plays. We knew that we couldn't put out a quality product. And it was, it got to the point, like you said, it's not a job. We weren't really having fun doing it. And Nolan and I love sitting here on Sundays. This is our 124th episode. We Not love really sitting good. here and talking and just having fun, talking about the games that are coming out and doing a little bit of a deep dive because we're fucking nerds and we love that shit. Yeah. It's People love listening like me, so. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. I do want to talk about horror role-playing. And I can see behind you, you have a hell of a collection of Stephen King novels behind you. So yeah. you are clearly a fan of horror. And I, I just want to know, because um, obviously horror role-playing is big. Uh, Wizards of the Coast put out Icewind Dale, which is a horror role-playing game. Uh, Curse of Strahd, or not Curse of Strahd, but uh, the uh, Von Richten's Guide that's coming out. World of Darkness is a horror role-playing Call of Cthulhu. There's there's a huge interest. I mean, hell, Cult. Cult has got to be one of the creepiest, deep, darkest games I've ever listened to I've or read. About, and yeah, I've heard about it. I've never read. It, man. Wow. I, I want to play this game. I really do because it is holy shit twisted, <laughs> and it's one of those that I think I could play like a one shot of and then have to take a break because I need a 
like Alex, uh, Jay- <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly jacob burgess uh who wor- uh, worked on cults of the blood gods uh he said he needed puppy time to get a break from how dark everything was and, yeah. and i'm like yeah i can see that um so anyway i want to talk about horror what drew you to horror role playing uh well my uh the fact that i enjoyed horror gaming um or not horror uh, novels i'm not like um for the record uh that's one of my four bookshelves this one book book like <laughs> book clout now but um uh I, I like horror. I like horror novels, but I don't like horror novels for um, like any uh, lack of bedroom, like any like macabre sense. Like I'm not one of those people who like to like watch like uh, what do they call those movies, like torture porn, kind of stuff like that. I don't. I don't like that. I like, I like the the feeling because I think um, in, in society and just in real life in general, I think that oftentimes to see the good, you have to have the contrast of the bad. You know what I mean? And um, and a lot of like the Stephen King stuff that drew me when I was younger. I used to be a bigger fan when I was younger. Um, was that sense of like good and evil, you know what I mean? And like you read books like The Stand, I mean, that's the main premise of The Stand, or you read it, you know, like which is, is one of my favorite books to this day. That's a big thing, good a sense of evil. And there's a lot of like lessons that can be learned in life by reading horror, I feel, and, and kind of like bringing that that sense of vul- uh, handling the sense of vulnerability, like death and loss and struggle that, that, that are tackled in um, horror, you know, it's almost like drama, you know, you kind of learn life skills in a weird way from reading drama or watching drama movies or just like old drama from the greek days you know what i mean like there's a lot of life lessons that can be learned from there so the horror gaming aspect really drew me to it uh because i could tackle a lot of uh horror themes and also like a lot of uh real life traumatic events and stuff like that that are horrific you know the real world can be very horrific horrific place you know it has to be inspiration for horror and unfortunately that can be the real world and so that's what i love about horror gaming in itself there is a difference between horror and terror. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, Nolan and I talk quite a bit about this because I think, you know, we see, uh, maybe I should just say not necessarily horror and terror. Like I think about seeing like some of the movies that we horror, horror quote horror movies that we see that are just basically a hack and slash movie. There's somebody just, there's just gore everywhere and they call that a horror film. Yeah. And then there's that horror that you mentioned that makes you uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And how do you, as a storyteller, when you're doing a, a horror role-playing game, how do you instill that feeling in your players? What are some of the things that you draw upon to do that? Uh, immersion, like deep immersion. <laughs> that sounds like super sick. Like I'm not like hypnotizing them or whatever, but I'm setting the scene, really like pulling them in there. You know, uh, some of the things I do that I like to do in my game, games and the horror games I run are some common things are one, asking a player what their characters think about something. You know, like sometimes I feel like a shrink. You know, what does your character feel about this? And they'll answer like, oh, is that because of your relationship with your father? Like your relationship with your father, you know, and I just kind of like get the char- the players in the mindset of their characters to start thinking about those characters. Not like, you know, you better talk in an accent or, you know, wear a costume. Just mean like, think really think from that perspective of this character you're playing. And then second, setting the scene, you know, using my five senses. Uh, I always talk about this when I'm interviewed about like what I do as a storyteller, something I learned from the military. A lot of times what I did in the military, you'd have to like um, in a way reenact like situations that you came across or things that you saw to give a big picture for planning purposes. And so that's utilizing your five senses. Like what do you smell? What do you feel? What do you hear? What do you see? You know, just really like try to like pull someone into that. Because you got look like there's an example here. Uh, for people who listen to my dread story uh there was a um uh in the second story arc of our twin cities by night story called homecoming there was a bench who had a ghoul who unfortunately was physically traumatized as like a sign for him to like step back from whatever he was doing and this venture was cold-hearted bastard and used uh um dominate just to be like hey this didn't happen, you know what I mean? So this this woman who was a school had all this trauma, obviously pushed back in her head from being dominated with the forgetful mind power. Well, <clears throat> their story arc, that character had died. And so what I wanted was to tackle, like this ghoul was starting to like, these memories were starting to pop up in her subconscious about stuff that had happened. And so um, there were, I set up the scene in the third story arc where like two of the, uh, the players uh, characters were looking for this one player not knowing he had died and they go to like this establishment that he has where this lady's in there um to ask her what happened and so i kind of set this tone like where they walk in and like there's like how dim it is and how like there's no one there and there's no music playing and then they kind of hear like a slight sobbing and they slowly like building this anticipation to where they walk up to the bar and they look behind and they see that she's 
taken a bridal pad to her forehead because when she was assaulted, someone uh, wrote something on her forehead. And so she's like bridal padding and not remembering, you know, why she's doing it, but just feeling like she had something done on there. And I had a uh, um, uh, Joseph, who's one of the producers from H the podcast, like reached out to me, like, dude, that scene, what the fuck, you know? Because I explained like how like had looked like a skin knee and it had it wasn't bleeding, but it had a thin veneer of like 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 uh, white blood cells and like mucusy, and you could see like the flesh a little bit. And just, like, I, I really like took time describing it, and the players, like, oh shit, you know what I mean? They're just like having to react to that. So it's like this slow build up and really pulling them in there. Where on the reverse end, if I would have been like, oh yeah, you walk into his uh, bar and uh, you hear some noise and he goes back there and she's just bridal pad in her head they would go oh what's going on here you know and, and during the whole time too i'm even like so what are you thinking not hearing this like what is your character thinking like like i don't know like i want to walk closer and then you start incorporating the beast one player had it fed so he, he, he failed his self-control so he had to leave because he didn't want to frenzy you know when he saw what happened so you like just build this tension and it like, just builds up and that's what you can do as a storyteller you know not everything has to be like just walk in a room and there's someone in the bar, behind the bar crying, you know, because they're not going to, they're not going to react the same way. And a lot of times it's the player's reaction, you know, that's at least my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Nolan, you're not somebody who typically dives into horror role playing. I kind of had to drag you into vampire a little bit. And, and I know there's been definitely times where we will have a scene and every one of us, the scene will end and every one of us are just kind of looking at each other like, what the fuck just happened? And so I'm, I'm curious, uh, as someone who doesn't, you know, typically normally gravitate towards horror role playing, um, what are some of your thoughts on horror role playing? Um, I... <clears throat> My goal with it and when we've played it and stuff like that is one of the things that I always check myself to make sure, okay, are you having a weird feeling about what's happening? Okay, you're still normal. Let's keep going. Um, just because sometimes it is. Uh, I know that a lot of my horror characters usually are uh, either fairly old and don't give a shit or fairly young and don't know better so I can add an element of comedy into it. So I can, I can, you know, you can snap somebody's neck and feed on them and be like, I, you know, this guy's got a poor diet or whatever, and make a, a, a wise crack about it. Cause you know, just to help, uh, deal with a little bit more. Um, the other thing that I find on is it's a lot easier to push that thing, right? Like you feel that unease and, and I'm a big person of liking experiences and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, this makes me feel a little fucked up. Let's dig a little deeper. And, and, and that's usually where the best seems come from. Cause like you said, it, it's getting pulled out of you or whatever. And you're like, okay, I want to see how dark this goes without going over the edge or anything like that. Let's see how close we can dance that line. Um, at the end of the day, I, I still like high fantasy. I have a hard time not playing a paladin. I like, I like being a hero. I like doing the right thing. Um, just because the world is so dark as it is, you know, I can't sit in my room and, and, and fix, you know, things. So I get to do it in the gaming world, but in here I, it's, if you're not into it, it's okay, but I, I recommend playing it because I became a better role player because of it. Because it isn't about the hack and slash. It isn't about that stuff. It's about the psychological thing. So now when I sit at a table at d and I'm a, I'm a one-upper, right? I'm going to set the tone for the story. I'm going to have a little goofy voice. I'm going to go over the top, and I'm going to try and bring the players with me because of my experiences with Vampire because it is so psychological. It is so weird. And you ha you get in that mindset and you kind of walk away and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know I had that in me or I didn't know I had that in my subconscious or I'm so happy I don't think that way normally. Like, I'm sorry that was really messed up. I, you know, whatever. So. Yeah. Uh, the good thing about Vampire 2 that I like and um, other horror games too is you can choose to like, like, like at least in Revised, like the humanity system. You know, and you can have where something's done, and depending on the role, like you talk about the evolution of someone and how they can become, um, it can be a very intense game. I mean, when I run stuff, I mean, it's funny. I hear stories of people like, "Oh, I ran like four sessions this weekend," and da da da. Like, dude, I've run one session. I have a hangover for like a week. You know, like a I call it the ST hangover, where I'm just kind of like, Ugh. you know, because there's some very intense stuff that you can run. And, and like I said, though, like it doesn't have to be like intense personal decisions. You know what I mean? Like the, I, we've had both. Like we had one scene and in the dread story where Katal, the gang girl played by Quinn had a feed and it was just a random thing. And he did, he actually had this girl in his car because he's trying to take care of her that he found. And he, and he, uh, built a self-control role. So he didn't want a frenzy on her. So he spent a willpower point to get out of the car. And he's in the middle of this, like, uh, suburb of, of the twin cities you know and he's trying to like desperately trying to find something to feed because he knows he can't go back to this girl because he's gonna kill her and he doesn't want to kill her if he does it so like we have this whole creepy scene where like he breaks into this house and then he like looks in one room and he sees like a, a boy who's asleep and he's like oh and he has to make a self-control roll and he goes to the next room and then it's like a girl and he like makes a self-control roll barely and then he goes and he sees like there's a father and a mother and he sneaks in and he like feeds off the 
father and is able to like sneak out but it's like this huge it was like off the top of our heads like this huge like intense like scene but then on the other end in our wars on fire game which is a sabat game which is going to deal with like some darker stuff like you know sometimes you got to like put a you got to say okay i gotta step away for a second and we had what like the uh, alex the player of coyote um like who had to be like hey can we come back to me you know and i'm like we're fine like that we have the x card we're huge proponents of the x card or fade to black you know what i mean especially me i fade to black quite a bit i'll be like, all right let's fade to black here you know because the, the to me the intent is not to be an edge lord and i fucking hate edge lords i just hate the fact that like oh you know like the, the thing that I, I don't comment on social media shit like when it comes to role playing games to the no you're not going to change anyone's mind but like uh nothing pisses me off more when like some assholes like you know, oh, you can't deal with X, Y, Z. This is the game, and you wouldn't be at my table and all that shit. Like, are you fucking kidding me, dude? Like, what kind of retarded ass my mentality is that to be like, if you can't deal with senseless violence, and you're just not playing my game, and it's like, then you're playing for the wrong reasons. You're not playing to tell a story, dude. You know what I mean? Because that you can't, you don't know everyone's trauma that they've experienced at the table. You know what I'm saying? Like, and and something may really touch a fucking nerve, and you're an asshole if you're sitting there telling them to sit through that in the case of playing make believe. Like, are you fucking kidding me? You know what I mean? Like, that's that's what's right. not. And I, I've listened to you before uh, talk about, you know, like, hey, you know, like, I prefer high fantasy. And I get that. You know what I mean? Like, you can't expect everyone to like the same shit. You know what I mean? And you can't fault them for that. And I, I totally understand. Like, hey, there's enough fucked up shit in the real world. And people handle things in different ways. I like to explore it and, like, the stuff that we do. You know what I mean? For me. But I get it where someone's like, hey, that's not my jam. And I'm like, okay, that's cool, man. I dig it. You do you, brother. You know what I mean? I'm never going to fault anyone for that. Well, and you've, right. you know, I think with a good horror film or something like that, like my mind's way more messed up than you could ever show me. And so yeah. sometimes setting the scene in this year, like I'm going to, you know, we don't need to know every gory detail about it because I'm going to make it worse than you could ever describe to me. So, yeah. you know, sometimes it is leading up to that thing and, and, and just letting it be is okay. Let it be because yeah. I'm going to make it worse. It's the worst the thing I ever saw. The yeah. imagination is the worst fucking thing. Alfred Hitchcock and Psycho. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like you don't need to see or get stabbed. You're just going, oh fuck, the imagination's gonna do itself, man, for sure. Yep. And it's a game. We're all here to have fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Contrary to what people think, I guess. And and horror role playing is definitely not for everyone. And, and again, Nolan and I have talked quite a bit, like it's cult specifically. Like I've listened to some of the stuff that Redmond role playing's put out for cult, and it's some dark, twisted shit. I mean, there's <laughs> I, I have a very vivid imagination and I listen to those games and I'm like, holy shit. And there's definitely times where I'm like, okay, I can listen to one episode and then I need to wait till tomorrow to listen to the next episode because that is a little bit too intense for me. Uh, Cult is definitely one of those games that's going to push you probably more than you're comfortable pushing. And, and I think it's okay to be pushed like that. I'm okay being uncomfortable, especially like you said, you're a big fan of the X card, Chris. And, and I think that is so important. That's, and it leads me to a question. Um, how do you deal with the situation where you have a player who you unknowingly have pushed too far and, 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 and they have a, a negative reaction, like even in the game, have you ever had an experience like that where you accident unknowingly, completely unintentionally push somebody to a point where it was bad and you had to say, wait, stop, hold on. What's going on? Um, no, I, I, I haven't had that. I don't think, cause I think like just with us playing for so long together. And like when I started Twin Cities by night, I, I uh, was very open, like, hey, this is going to be deal with personal horror themes. You know, this is going to be like superhero fangs kind of thing. It's going to be, and I was very open about that. There's a scene, we have an NPC called uh, Roman Dunstern. Um, he's a ghoul uh, for the Giovanni. Dunsterns are like a um, like a family that's within the Giovanni, for those of you who don't know. Um, and there was a scene involving him early, 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 like our fourth time ever playing that, like, I look back on now and, like, Ooh, that was a little too on the head. You know what I mean? Like, I wish I could go back and redo it, but that's part of the learning. But we've never, you know, no, we've never had, like, anything like that. Like, but but I know my audience. So, like like I said, I know my, my players, you know what I mean? And I know what they're capable of. We talk all the time. We're fucking, they're, we're buddies, you know what I mean? So we know each other's, like, levels of stuff. Like, for Monster Hearts, for example, that uh, I'm not in Monster Hearts. I'm not playing it or running it. Um, Tillman, though, he talked to the players beforehand. He's like, hey, you know, like, what are boundaries? What are, you know what I mean? Like, just so we know and, and you know, everyone knows that. And I, I, I mean, like, again, like, listen, I'm not like, I mean, you know me outside of here, Patrick, where I'm like social media, got Facebook, you know, I'm not like a hippie and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not the most like, you know, whatever, but it's like, 
I think that these things exist in gaming for good reasons. You, if you're gonna play a horror game, you've got to know this, dude. You can't have that ignorant mindset where it's like everything should be on the table because then it's like you're gonna fuck your friends up, maybe. You know what I mean? And you're gonna like make it unenjoyable. And I don't want to lose friends over that for real, you know. But um, but the pat, the dude, the it's so funny. Like I um, listen to you guys about uh uh D and D fifth. Mate, I think I told you beforehand. Like I went and bought the two uh the players guy and DMs guy from Barnes and Nobles one day because I'm like, oh fuck, I always hear these guys talk about. It. Let me get it. And then uh, we've been playing Thirteenth Age. And I was joking with Slavic, who runs 13th Age, and I was like, this is fucking awesome. And he's like, like, this is such a nice break from, like, you know, like, just, I played a thief. It took me, like, the third time play where I played a thief, and I'm, like, backstabbing motherfuckers and teleporting and all that shit. I'm like, this is fucking rad. I get it now. I get it. Like, why? this is just such a nice palate cleanser, you know, from, like, playing heavy shit, you know what I mean? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and that's a great point. And I know, like, Nolan Nolan is, is definitely our, our D&D guru. He, he he keeps me playing D&D, without a doubt. Now, it's nice that Wizards of the Coast puts out stuff that I am interested in, like the Ravenloft stuff, and Nolan's able to just tempt me with little carrots here and there and say, oh, look, Patrick, yep, we're going to keep playing. Although now that Lord of the Rings is coming out, that that's now me tempting him. But you're right. It is nice to be able to take a break from some of these heavier games. And let's face it role-playing games are especially world of darkness or horror role-playing games are heavy and and like i think about call of cthulhu and i've, I've only played call of cthulhu once I had the time of my life the guy who ran it did a fantastic job it was a creepy game and it seemed like every time we turned around like he would you know talk about a random noise you heard and like from the bathroom the toilet seat would fall down you know weird things like that always seemed to happen it was so bizarre but one of the things that we talk about is is some of these heavier games called Call of, Call of Cthulhu and stuff like that seem to lend themselves like because for those of you who don't know and it blows me away that people may not know this one of your biggest goals in Call of Cthulhu is not to go insane right because there's so much eldritch horror or, or just shit that you deal with and I love that system in Call of Cthulhu and it really seems to me that it lends itself to a very short story arc. It's not something that I can see playing long term. And I think you're right. Like D D gives you a nice chance to step away. It's okay, we're gonna go play D D, rinse our brains from all this dark shit and, and have fun, still be able to immerse in and Nolan, you brought this up. You know, it made you a better role player playing those types of games. So I really think that adding all these aspects together helps. And so, Chris, my my question to you, and, and I'm a long way to get here is Someone comes to you and they've never played a horror role-playing game before. What would you say to them? Would you give them any sort of warning? Or what are some advice that you tell somebody who's never done it before? Oh, man, that's, good. that's a good question. I should have figured that was going to be a question being asked. I would say that, like, it's a good way to, uh, if they're intimidated, it's a good way to explore things in life and to process things in life. Um, there's countless, countless, countless things and stuff that I've ran that I've done and that players have done um, to explore and to process past trauma that they've experienced. Um, you know, I, I have NPCs in my games that are brothers of mine that uh, took their own life, that, that I have that use the same fucking name, and it's a way for me to process them and to uh, relive, like, what I enjoyed about them. Um, there's things that you read about in the world, you know, things that I process through that, you know? So um, if you look at, like, a healthy mechanism rather than a mechanism to... Um, to disturb yourself of course i mean you, you mentioned call of cthulhu like there's so many different styles of horror games that you can run you know what i mean like call of cthulhu even has within it you know we uh craig who's like a resident call of cthulhu uh guy ran uh my little sister will make you suffer that i played in and it was a weird dystopian running man you know in a hunger games trying to survive against your peers kind of thing and then i ran hotel hell which is like a haunted hotel you know what I mean? Different things. There's so many different ways that you could do that brings out different things. Not every horror game, though, has to be deep personal reflection or extremely disturbing horror. It could just be spooky ass shit like Scooby Doo. You know what I mean? It could be like the Delta Green shit where you're like X Files stuff and you know what I mean? And you're exploring. So you can very easily play a horror game and not prepare to be fucked up and have to, you know, sleep. We talked about Mage before. Mage is a horror game. It deals with me. It deals with fucking people who have the ability to change reality, but have the human flaws of hubris and like thinking they know what's right for free reality on both ends of the spectrum. 
You know, you think of cult leaders like Jim Jones and all this shit. You know what I mean? That could potentially bend mages. So there's different horrors. You know, not everything has to be like cult. You know what I mean? Which I don't even want to know. Like, my mind is going like, oh, geez, how fucked up is this game? You know, I keep hearing about it. but It's fucked up. Yeah, yeah. But you can do different eerie horrors. Like, I, I have a book in front of me, and I, I pulled this book out before we did it just because I wanted to bring up a story in here if it came up. Uh, it's a book called The, uh, the Mago Sequence. Uh, it's a short story uh, collection written by a gentleman named uh, Laird, Laird Barron. Um, has a very, like, Delta Green kind of weird horror vibe to it. Looks like your recording thing went off. I just want to see. Yeah, I saw that. Well, okay. don't worry about it. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so it uh, has a recording vibe. Uh, actually, recording vibe. has a uh, weird fiction like Delta Green vibe. And there's a story called The uh, Procession of the Black Sloth that I read this last summer. And I wanted, I pulled this out because when I finished reading the story, it wasn't a disturbing story like where like visually you would think of anything fucked up, but how it made me feel at the end just made me feel like, oh, God, dude. Like, and a little bit of spoilers. But, but it deals with, like, basically a guy who is an American who's working for a company that has a presence in China. And they have, like, a, um, one of those camps, like, anyone who's done security contracting, like I have or whatever. You, go, you see them in Kuwait, Iran, whatever. But I, I, the company is, like, a technical company or something like that or oil company. I can't remember. And you have all these different people from Europe or, they, you know, people who are living there with their families. Long story short, through all this, like, weird, like, fiction kind of vibe, you find out it's hell. The dude's in hell. And like, like basically he just realized he's in hell and it's like this weird, like at the end of it, but the way he does it, it's like such a re reveal. You're like, oh, like it made me feel like, I remember I was outside in my backyard reading it, looking at my lawn, hearing the birds sing, enjoying the sunshine during the nice spring summer day. And I read that, I was like, oh my fucking God, this is ruined my day. But it was in such a good way though, but it wasn't like anything that was like, you know, like disturbingly like saw or anything like that, dude. And that's fun though. That's like walking to that edge there and that little bit like a roller coaster, you know what I mean? It's like, it brings that fun. And that's why I like about horror sometimes too, you know? We, we look at a lot of that stuff and I think I, I think a big thing for me is like I personalize a lot of stuff. So like for me, like one of the most messed up movies I saw was The Road, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like as a, as a, as a, as a father and that stuff, like those are like my things. And I think Colt deals with that stuff a lot too. You know, like for me, the impossible situation is, is not being able to save your kids. Right. And so yeah. it's, it's one of those things of like, you know, that's kind of my thing of like, you know, okay, this is my line to say, like, I, I don't mind. I'm just going to take it a lot more personal. Don't be too weird with it. So I would say that having that conversation of saying, you know, going into it, uh, session zero yeah. is what is in D and D. What are you not okay with? I don't, you know, or this is going to have something in it just so you know, if it goes too far, you know, let me know. Or if it's pushing a thing, you know, feeding on children or whatever it is, you know, some people have flaws and, and it is what it yeah. is, but yeah, just communication. I think we talked about that in D and D as well of be open to having an experience, but also at the same time, if it's not, if it's not going the way you thought it was going to, or if you're having a bad time, talk to your game master, your storyteller, your DM, because again, they want you yeah. to be there. They want you to have fun. I, I, you can't run a game by yourself. So. And it's also on DMs and STs to check with their players. I do that once in a while. But hey, what's going? What do you think about the story so far? You know what I mean? Like, and and we have that relationship with those speak out. And thankfully, I haven't had anyone be like, "It sucks, fuck you." You know what I mean? Like, but you know, I still ask anyways. <laughs> I, I I will say, like you, you, Nolan, you mentioned feeding on children. Um, we were playing through Giovanni Chronicles, and my wife was playing a Malkavian, and one of her flaws was she had to feed on children, and she was very much into like, yeah, I I want to go ahead and and you know role play this and and there was a point where it was like okay i knew how far we could go without making everybody else at the table uncomfortable and i do think you know when it comes to horror role playing you have to understand that just because one person's good with it doesn't mean the entire party is good with it so you i think you have to be able to say okay we could take it to this far but then we have to stop because i'm not gonna give your make your pleasure uh, paramount to everybody else and, and have, you know, four or five people sitting there feeling horribly uncomfortable. And it was enough. I mean, she was, you know, gracious enough to say, yeah, no, that works. And I, and I think that's the other thing is you have to know your player's limits. And you talked about checking in, Chris. There were times during Giovanni Chronicles, like especially, I, I'm assuming you know the Giovanni Chronicles, Chris. Yeah, I figured you did. You've yeah. been around, yeah, you've been around World of Darkness long enough. So, um, you know, the very first book, they put taps in their necks. And I, I remember looking at Nolan and just seeing the look on his face. And it was one of those moments where we had to say, all right, cool, guys, let's take a break. Is everybody okay? Yeah, and I think like, it was just catch, yeah, catch you off. That catches you off. You're like, oh, it's going to be this kind of thing. Uh, okay, okay, buckle in. 
Yeah, Giovanni Chronicles, I think, suffered a little bit from like the 90s edge lordiness. Sure. You know what I mean? Because like my first thing, how does that logistically work with the tops? And like, like not, I don't think about that kind of stuff and it grosses me out, but it's just like, wouldn't someone die if you put like, oh, yeah, you know? absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, yeah like, and, and I think you're right. And and it was a Black Dog Gaming Factory book, and they were yeah. they. I mean, they made it very clear we are going to be pushing the limits with these books. Yeah, Clan Book Bali, Jesus Christ. Like, yeah, that was the first book I read. I almost threw it across the room and been like, "Fuck this!" Like that <laughs> you do not need that. You do not need that. Even in the '90s, they didn't. Need that. Right. You know. <laughs> So we have we have come to the end of our show. This is we're a little bit longer than what we normally do, but I wanted to give you time, Chris, to talk. Um, Nolan, before we sign off, do you have any other questions for Chris? I don't think so. No, uh, it's it's informative. It's nice to see another genre that goes away from what I'm into, um, and and kind of as my signing off thing there. I would say play them just because I don't have a high fantasy character now that doesn't have some sort of story. Because who in their right mind picks up a great sword? learns fireball and tracks down a group of goblins and still murders them to loot their bodies and take their treasures. You wipe out civilizations of monsters uh, and you get rewarded for it. You're just as messed up as the people doing the weird stuff of vampire. They're doing it to survive and do stuff. You're doing it for fun. So, so take some of that stuff because you got to be kind of fucked up as well to hit the road and slaughter for a living. I mean, period. So, uh, don't, don't think that there is no noble path to genocide of goblins. Okay. You, you are going to deal with it and, and have that kind of situation where it's like, okay, my body count now is like 300 because of that fireball. How do you feel about that? Because, you know, are you, you shouldn't be okay with it. That doesn't matter what they are, right? So uh, use them, use all the games and, and take a little bit with it and have fun with it. So, Chris, any last minute advice? Just play games, have fun. That's, Don't take yourself too There you go. There you uh, go. Chris, I do ask Chris that you do send me your, all your links because I want to make sure that we get those in the show notes so that way folks can come in here and shake, take a look. So if you don't mind emailing that to me, that would be great. I would greatly appreciate that um thank you so much for being here it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show for sure man it's been a blast it's kind of surreal being on here i listen to you guys all the time so good stuff well, we appreciate that that is our show for this week thank you guys so much for joining us and 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 tuning in we really appreciate it like i said this was our 124th episode hard to believe that we've been doing it this long nolan and, and i think about you know like what chris was saying where they started and where they are now you know very same for us where we started and where we are now i mean originally we started this podcast we were all sitting in the same room together now we're in separate houses across well we're actually just a couple blocks away because we live on the same street but it's it's just interesting interesting to see you know how far things have come along and and i really appreciate everybody who has joined us along for this ride um nolan anything else before we go thumbs it up man perfect thank you so much for listening everybody have a good week bye bye <laughs>